we have is, is unlike child support, in which we have a very strict guideline in Missouri, we, uh, for maintenance, we are stuck with what I call the wild, wild west. It literally is judge to judge. Uh, there's no set guideline. There's no set formula. It is uh, a world of gray. Um, it's up to each individual judge to make a determination about whether the door is open to maintenance and how far that door is open. For a court to award maintenance is going to require that not only does the person need it, but the other side can pay it. So I ask myself two questions when I'm looking at a case and dealing with maintenance. First I ask, does the person seeking maintenance need support? The answer is no, it's not a maintenance case. Next question, if it is yes, then we go on to the next question. Can the other spouse, uh, can the spouse that's purporting to pay maintenance, being asked to pay maintenance, meet his reasonable needs and expenses and still pay maintenance? Child support usually going to, is, is going to come first. Uh, so take that into consideration when determining if the person can pay or not. The burden of proof is upon the party seeking the claim of maintenance. As I mentioned before, the trial judge has substantial discretion in awarding maintenance. And we have a powerful tool in the state of Missouri that not every state has, and that's an automatic change of judge. The fact is we can take a change of judge as a right in a divorce case every single time. And if, my opinion is if you're failing to consider that and failing to take changes of judges in cases in which your client is going to be defending a maintenance claim, you're probably committing malpractice. I, I talked to an attorney, a friend of a friend, and we were talking about domestic relations in the metro area, and he told me in 10 years he had never taken a change of judge. I, I don't know if my eyes actually bulged and popped out of, their, out of their head. And I said, well, I haven't taken a change this month. <laughs> Start gathering records as soon as they retain. Maintenance is a very detail-intensive aspect of a divorce case. You're looking at often small, relatively small issues I mean, compared to the value of the house. What's the difference if she put, uh, or what the electric bill is? Well, if it's $100 high, then that's $100, and you don't investigate that, that's $100 that you're missing out on that your client may end up having to pay. Not one month, not one year, but maybe 10 years. And Maybe it's not going to exceed the, the equity and the value of a house, but that's one small item and small issue. And you're going to be looking at, in a lot of maintenance cases, very small issues such as getting the correct amount of the electric bill, the utility bills. It's very detail-oriented. The earlier you start collecting this information, the easier your life is going to be when it comes around to a trial. If a significant raise is coming in the near future, perhaps we're at this point in time, you know we're going to get a, a, a big bonus at the end of the year. Maybe we want to file now, try and settle the case quickly before we get to trial, before that bonus comes through and they have evidence of increased income. If the person seeking maintenance income is less than their expenses, that's going to open up a maintenance claim. Keyword though is reasonable expenses. The statute specifies reasonable. One factor for reasonable is going to be what did the parties spend during the course of the marriage. But that's not all inclusive. There are cases such as Newman that say even if the parties spent it during the marriage, that doesn't necessarily make it reasonable. If the parties have already separated and your client is not paying maintenance, but the other spouse has been meeting their expenses, while the parties have been separated, the more history you have of that, the better argument you have for the court. If she hasn't been, if she, if she hasn't required maintenance during the separation, easy argument is, why is she required after the divorce? Make sure that every one of the expenses that your client puts down on their financial statement can be justified. There's going to be a tendency for people that are asking for maintenance to inflate expenses. Consider in doing that, if you're prosecuting, bringing a claim of maintenance, why are you doing that and opening your client up to cross-examination and making them look like a liar when I can prove that they don't spend $2,000 a month on clothing? You've, made, you've now made your client look like a liar in court if you are bringing and, and allow that to go through on the other side. 
also in a maintenance claim, you in all likelihood are going to have to do a number of subpoenas. We're not going to have, unless your client has been very thorough in keeping Microsoft money or Quicken type of records, um, you're going to have to send out subpoenas and, and get information from Union Electric, from the fleet gas, from the credit card statements. You're going to have to get all of the bank records and really dwell into them to look at how much is spent at Deerberg's and Kroger's. And it is tedious, and it is long, and it is not a lot of fun. But it is necessary because, as I said before, you can save $100 here and $100 there. You come to the point where it's no longer a maintenance claim. Income for child support purposes must be the same as the income used for maintenance purposes. And a little trick that's been used is I've had people stipulate to a Form 14. So we've agreed to the child support amount, and then they think they're going to be able to go in and argue income on the maintenance claim that we're trying. They've already stipulated to the income when they stipulated the Form 14. So they're out of luck. If there's twice as much income between our One's at 30, one's at 60, one's at 50, one's at 100. I'm going to probably consider that a maintenance case. But I'm going to look at the length of the, of the marriage. Uh, there is nothing that says a six-month marriage cannot uh, result in a maintenance claim. I've had one case in 10 years plus that uh, for, for a marriage of a year, the court awarded maintenance. Uh, happened that the wife went blind. There wasn't much we could do about that. So it was extraordinary circumstances. I've had a number of judges in St. Louis County tell me that about five years is sort of their cutoff. I've had uh, a couple other judges in St. Louis County say seven years. Um, I had a judge in Kansas City say it was about 10 years. So probably about seven, five to seven is probably the typical time in which the door starts cracking open for a maintenance claim. Look at the age of the parties. I think it's much easier for someone, a wife, let's say, in, the 50, in her 50s that hasn't worked for a significant number of years to uh, get a maintenance claim uh, award compared to a wife that's in the late 30s. Uh, they're able to go out, still get an education, still get uh, earn sufficient income to meet their reasonable needs and expenses. Look at the ages of the children. Again, right from the statute. Someone has to stay home because they have infant children. That's going to bolster a claim of maintenance. So maybe the defense is, again, get custody and try and get 50% of the time report. Look, if there's any disabilities on both sides. It, I had a reason, uh, I had a case in which I had a pharmacist, but he was uh, at bad knees and high blood pressure and, and may not have been in a position to work that job much longer. And so that was something we looked at in bringing in medical experts. Obviously, disability on the other side, person claiming support is going to have a, a large impact on if that's an award or not. Because it's going to really curtail your ability to impute income to someone that hasn't worked or is not working full time. Look at misconduct. Um, George is very nice because misconduct is a total bar to maintenance. So that becomes a, a very large issue. Here it is a factor. If someone caused a breakdown of the marriage or not, it's going to have an influence on the judge to open the door up or not. Look at the unsecured debt and how that has been derived as an expense. It's probably one of the least, in, in this, doing this initial assessment, it's probably one of the least important factors, but it's going to have a big impact on the ability to pay. At this point in time, we usually don't have a full assessment uh, of the expenses, and but the amount of unsecured debt that someone is, is pulling will usually give you an idea of what their financial situation is. 